Be Like a Crow, a solo RPG created by Tim Roberts. Fans of the channel will recognize this game. We've done a couple of episodes, live streams of this game in progress, but it is a fascinating look at a different style of RPG. And as you know, here in the House of Wargaming, we believe that if you're playing RPGs correctly, you're playing a war game. If you squint your eyes just right, this can be considered something of a war game. I'll explain why in a few moments. Before I do, let me just say that I'm, I'm making a regularly scheduled video for this title with a little bit more thought into it than just you know knee-jerk off the cuff play because we've played a couple of sessions. I think it's worth a deep dive and a solid review of what makes this game so good. And we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics later on in this video as well. Before we get into that, let's just do a quick flip through. Mr. Roberts here, good old Timmy, he actually introduces the concept of a solo RPG. This is a bit of a journaling RPG game. He recommends that you play a turn or two, and then you write out in journal form what happened to your character. And then you go and you play a couple of more turns, and then you write out in your journal. Now, this is not the same as writing a story, because it is just a journal in the way that you might journal your day. I got up, and I went to the store, and I had a flat tire. And then the next day, you have another day. And maybe there's connections where you look back and realize, oh, I had a flat tire because I forgot to take it into the shop two weeks ago. What you don't have is an overall 3X structure. This is my kind of war game where you just roll your dice, let them land where they may, although this is not this is a diceless game. It uses a deck of cards. We're going to get into that. Oh, good stuff. Oh, mwah. good, such good stuff in here. You don't have a three-act structure. You're not writing a story that you then force the game in to work with the story. What you're doing is you're allowing the events to occur, and you're looking for connections, and you're, you're deciding how that narrative takes shape organically. Very good. Now, as, I, as it says, be like a crow means you are going to be a crow. Well, kind of. You're going to be a corvid. There are six different character classes, carrion crow, magpie, Rook, Raven, and Jackdaw. Well, that's five. There are five character classes, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. This is what the character sheet looks like. Name, setting, if you have a picture, you have six hit points. You can take six injuries. And then there are four skill sets, and each tick in these skills gives you a plus one to your skill check. Skill checks are very easy. All you have to do is draw a card. That queen is your target number. Draw another card to see whether you beat it or not. Add your relevant tick. So if I was doing a fly check, it's raining. Can I fly? And I've got plus three to my fly. I just got a seven, which is less than queen. And I may suffer some deleterious effects because I failed that check. Jokers allow you to heal. You hang on to these. All the rest of the cards get turned over. Jokers, you put in your pocket, and you can play them at any time to heal two wounds or automatically pass a skill check or discard a card and draw again. Combat works the same way. You, as the hero of the story, get the first action. You can elect to evade. That's a skill check. And bear in mind, evade is one of the skills we have here. Need a seven? Got a five. I didn't do it. Or you can attack. If you attack, you do one point of damage to your enemies. And enemies only have three characteristics that are important. Basically, it's their two hit, how much damage they do when they hit you, and how many hit points they have. Very simple, very streamlined. Goes, plays like butter. But before we get too deep into that, let's take a look at the six settings that come with the at least this boilerplate version of the the original be like a crow you can play in an urban setting cyber setting right so cyberpunk gothic so you're in castles and vampire land fantasy steampunk and ravens of the tower this is the actual tower of london and each of those settings comes with its own characters objects and difficulties well, not so much difficulties. I, I guess you could call them characters, and locations is, is the way to put it. These locations are keyed to locations on one of the maps, like this.
But what do you actually do? Well, as I said, everything is card driven and the objectives that you have, you draw an objective to begin and that will depend on both the suit and the number that you've drawn. The objectives will depend upon the setting that you've chosen. For fantasy, it may be something like retrieve a stolen object from a given character. And of course, the characters and the locations, and that character will be at a location, will be the sorts of things you'd find in a fantasy world. A ruined temple, a riverbank, a small tree cover island, a necromancer's, necromancers, we gotta pronounce it necromancers because, hey, you know why. Whereas if you turn your page to the Ravens of the Tower, your prompt may be two of the Monarch's Council, well, listen, it's 2024, two of the King's Council are fighting for possession of an object which is in the hands of a character. So as an example, let's take a look. The Tower of London has a total of 26 different objects that you might need to recover. The feather of a swan, the King's own bird. Alternatively, a fish hook. Make a tool use check near water to catch a fish to eat. This is what the object will allow you to do. And the locations will all reflect the map for the Tower of London, seen here. These may be specific labeled locations or more generic rundown stables or a busy public park. In some cases, it will be obvious which park you need to go to. In some cases, you have to exercise your judgment. As this is a role-playing game, you may find yourself adjusting the difficulty on the fly. You may choose a more difficult task. When you have to fly to that park, you fly to a new hex. And there are events which are themselves universal. These events apply across the across the genres that you are in. It may be something like a rook flies in and asks for your help. If you accept, generate a new objective. Again, using the charts by drawing a new card on your chosen genre. These events may be something along the lines of a jackdaw has an object, or you become lost, make a navigate skill check, and if you fail, you have to stay here and generate a new, a, a new event. The black suit, uh, there are also events on land. When you land and you search an area or you perform some task, before you can perform that task, you have to go through two land-based events. So we'll cut the deck and we'll take a look. The queen, the red card queen, see here we go, events on land. This is the queen. You meet a swan who has an object and will trade it for one of your objects. You can only hold two objects, by the way. One in your beak and one in your hands. So choose wisely. We love a good role-playing game that incorporates encumbrance into it, and this is one of the simplest and most effective that I've seen. On the other hand, you may get a five. A hungry cat pounces on you, fight for your life. And here's what we were talking about earlier. The cat will attack with a plus two. The cat attacks the same as you. He is going to need a queen and look with a six plus two. Oh, he failed which is good because if the hungry cat did succeed in attacking you, he would do one point of damage. He has four hit points. Probably want to run from this guy. Fight for your life or evade. If you reduce the cat's injury score to one, it runs away and it drops an object. So these are the kind of events that you could have. You're hungry, make a search check for a snack. You meet a friendly character who gives you important information. What is that? Well, it all depends on the genre, it depends on what you need to know, and depends on where you're going. That's the bulk of it. You, you take a turn, you draw an event. If you're in flight, or two, if you are on land. Those events can generate new objectives. If you meet the number of objectives that are required, you can level up. Meet two objectives, and you go from fledgling to juvenile. When you do so, you unlock, for example, the, ur the urban crow, a juvenile, will unlock... You learn about the world around you. Add one tick to any two of your travel and exploration skills. What does that mean? Well, because I leveled up, because I fulfilled my objectives, I can pick any one of these skills and add two tick marks, which will give me bonuses on the skill checks, as we discussed earlier. Complete, I believe it's three objectives, and you become an adult, and now you've been on the world for, out in the world for some time. You've learned to rely on your survival instincts. Add two ticks to tool use, Two ticks to one skill from travel and exploration, combat, and social in interaction. Very simple, very basic role-playing game, but it is 
full of wonderful little connections that you make on the fly and that you develop as you go. As an example, let's take a look at the map that I've generated for my steampunk crow. I have named my clockwork city Seabaldington, and as you can see, there are numerous named locations. I started off on a crashed airship and had to go explore a series of windmills outside of town. What does that mean? It's entirely up to you. I decided to put the windmills up here on this ridge where they would be most likely to capture the wind and found the object I was looking for at the second windmill over here. Along the way, I realized that I was given a new mission. I needed to get to the docks. On my way to the docks, I recognized that the Duke's fort was in the way. I didn't want to tangle with the guards. So while I could have easily taken a direct path, I felt in typical role-playing game fashion, that the better route would be to avoid the Duke's Fort altogether. This is controlled airspace. I've made suboptimal choices that made the difficulty harder, but that fit in better with the setting, the genre, and the locations that I have found. As my game stands currently, there is a ship that has broken down and is drifting out to sea, and every day that I delay, that ship will move one more hex closer to sea. I now have a very difficult decision to make. Do I continue to pursue the objective that I was trying to achieve, or do I save all the poor innocent folks on this, this drifting steamship that's a Zeppelin? These are the kind of choices, meaningful choices, that we really enjoy in our games, and they come up as much or as little as you like in Be Like a Crow, and this is why I think this qualifies as something of a war game. First of all, there's a lot of one-to-one -one combat going on. I haven't had to fight any two-on-one -on -one combat yet. Not entirely sure how those would work, but also you have to worry about geographic difficulties like high mountains in the way of where you want to go. Objectives that are moving across the map and maybe moving may pull you away from your preferred route. It's a very clever game, and as I promised, I really want to talk about how wonderful the deck of cards is as a medium for solo wargaming because, and I'm not the first to mention this, but I think it's worth pointing out for those of you that haven't considered, unlike a set of dice. So here we have two D6. When you roll as an event, every single time you roll these dice is independent of the previous roll. You always have the same probability of rolling a 2 that, that you do on every single roll, on every other roll. It doesn't matter how many 2s I roll in a row, my next roll will have the same probability of generating a, a 2, or doubles, or boxcars, or what have you. The odds don't change from moment to moment. However, with a deck of cards, cards have memory to them. By that I mean... I have my joker. There's only one joker remaining. When I turn over this next card, instead of there being a 1 in 27 chance of a joker, 2 out of the 54 cards, now there is a 1 in 53 chance that I have a joker. I've drawn a 7. Before, there were three 7s in the deck. Now there's only, there were four 7s in the deck. Now there's only three. As I work my way through this deck, the number of red cards available are going down because I've drawn four red cards. And what that means is that as you generate objectives for your Corvid, here's our Gothic Crow. Your first objective using, suppose you've drawn a six, you've drawn a six. When I next go to draw and generate another objective, I am less likely to draw another six than I am all the rest of these cards. I've already burned one of the sixes. As I draw my next card, it's highly unlikely that I generate the same objective. Now I've got a different. Instead of an elderly crow requesting I deliver an object, I've got dark magic being cast by a character. I need to find that character and steal an object which is the source of his power. The fact that you've got memory in this deck of cards adds to the replayability and it adds to the unpredictability of what comes next. 
This is a shockingly elegant system for generating adventures that don't simply fall into a an if-then loop or into increasing amounts of repetition. The other nice thing is that because you've got, for example, your characters, the author, Tim Roberts, has given us not just the 13 characters, he's given us 26. The same rule applies only here because your characters are divided into black and red cards. Once I generate a lost banshee with the black five, there's only one other black five in this deck. Now, granted, once you get through a deck, you reshuffle and play through again, which does increase the odds of encountering the same character, but not right in a, or in a row. You're going to have to wait a little while before encountering that same character. And if you assume that the Lost Banshee you encounter the first time through the deck is the same as the Lost Banshee that you encounter through the second time in the deck, then you have the possibility, not the guarantee, but the possibility of recurring characters. In fact, one might even go so far as to recommend marking in the book, my lost banshee, give her a name, so that the next time you encounter her, if she has given you a different objective, you wind up with NPCs that are, have their own stories to tell, that you're revealing their stories as you reveal your own. What a great little game. Highly recommend this. I think this would be a very effective way to introduce role-playing games to children. Probably on the age of, you know, depending on how old they are, they may be able to just take it and run with it. Uh, but a five-year-old, if you sat next to them, instead of reading them a story, you can generate a story with them. Ask them for the name. Hey, child of mine, we're in the Cyber Crow, and we have met... A raven data courier. What should we name our raven? Let them help you invent the story. It's a wonderful exercise in creativity. You're doing it at their elbow so you can guide them along the way. Fun for all ages. It says solo, but it can be played with some friends. I will leave you with the advertisement in the back. Crothulu, cosmic horror setting. We have a new setting. Oh, look at that. Go beak to claw against pelican cults, eldritch parakeets. Includes new prompts, maps, and rules for fear, which you have to do in an H.P. Lovecraft setting, right? And, of course, Fistful of Feathers. This is tailor-made for a Wild West setting. As you fly from town to town, you'll have to deal with buffalo bandits, coyote drifters, and lizards who shoot from the hips. All of this is available at criticalkit.co.uk slash crow. And, of course, you can find the author on Twitch. He's got a couple of... Uh, do, you know, do a look for Critical Kit. Just like it sounds, one word, Critical Kit, here on YouTube. The author himself has a Let's Play of him using the book. It's a lot of fun. Well worth looking. It was $20, and I've gotten more fun out of this than I have out of $20 of going to the movies. Till next time, I'm praying for you.